I got really interested in computer security, uh, partly because it's kind of a game situation. There are two players. There's somebody trying to build a system, and there's somebody trying to attack it. And that really forms an interesting intellectual challenge. Uh, when we think about computer security, you have to think for a while about what the system is designed to do and how to make it have the functionality you want. And then on alternate days of the week or alternate weeks of the year, uh, you think from the other point of view and ask, how can I attack this system? Uh, so I think the research around this and the dialogue with different people developing systems is really uh, always very lively because you always have two perspectives and two ways to look at things. Uh, so that's really one fundamental part of the security field that I like. And another is that people care about it. It's a way to get into a lot of different kinds of discussions with different people about technology and its use in the world today. So it's a branch of computer science that, like many others now, uh, really brings you out of the laboratory uh, into the world in some very interesting ways. So one, one example that I think is interesting to think about is email. It's a really simple thing, and if you were back a few decades and someone said, design an email system, design a way for me to get a message to you, you'd think the whole purpose of the system was to take any message addressed by any one person to another person and deliver it. Really what we want from the email system is deliver every email that we want. and. In that, we get into all kinds of subtle issues about what do we really want to see, what do we want to deliver, and how do we screen out things and keep the volume under control so that the system really works for us. So the whole process of security analysis or incorporating security into the design and development of a system is, is really complicated. Uh, but there are a few principles that are really helpful. One is we always have a system that we want to have usable. We have some intended use. Uh, and then there are some very basic things that we'd like to protect. So if I was trying to uh, set up a system for me to buy something on the internet uh, from a vendor, I have to assume that whatever message I sent that might include my credit card number is going to be visible to somebody else. So how are we going to protect against an attacker with a specific set of capabilities and make sure we guarantee basic things like when I send my credit card out on the internet, it's only visible to the merchant that I want to communicate with and not visible to somebody else. Uh, there's a fundamental difference between functionality, designing something for its intended use, and security, designing something to prevent unintended use. For that reason, we have to really think about how people are going to misuse systems, and as we use them in important ways, uh, try to defend them against people who might try to steal data, steal our information, or misuse those systems for their own purposes in ways that uh, really are not things we want to have happen, and also interfere interfere with our access to our own material. There's been a big change since around 2000 in who is creating attacks and why. Uh, prior to about 2000, in many cases, what we saw on the web, for example, uh, were casual uh, people, kids in their basement, uh, kind of defacing a website just to kind of see uh, havoc come out of that, just people trying to create mischief. And then as the web became an instrument for uh, commerce and financial exchange, we saw the rise of people who were really there in a more organized, business-like manner trying to steal money. And then politics, uh, international conflict, uh, other kinds of global issues have brought a third kind of attacker into the picture, uh, someone who really wants to uh, cause harm or embarrass or disable or steal information about a political entity. One of the surprising things about this field, uh, when you delve into it, is to understand how hard some of the attackers really work in order to craft attacks. So we never want to assume the attacker is kind of a casual person. Uh, the attacks that happen in the real world are the result of tremendous amount of clever insight and ingenuity. So if we want to design something that's secure against the kind of attacks that a thoughtful, clever, creative, determined person would create, 
we can't really just do that by casual testing. Let me talk for a minute about a phrase that you might hear if you uh, read a little bit about security or talk to security professionals. It's called security by obscurity. So the phrase is a little bit derogatory when we say you're trying to achieve security by uh, obscurity. Normally the person saying that is, is being critical, but there are really two sides to this issue here. Uh, when we have an open standard, such as we have around most of the networking protocols and methods that uh, Comp, uh, computers and other uh, you know, devices used to communicate on the network, then something open is available for many, many people to examine and think about and study in various ways. So I think the open network security standards, uh, SSL or TLS transport layer security, are extremely secure because they're open to study and analysis and experimentation really worldwide by anybody who's interested. So that's kind of the best case. Uh, we believe that about our crypto systems too. They're all publishable. You can read about how the crypto systems work. And if something that's made public really ha cannot be attacked in any way that anyone has discovered, then we have a lot of uh, assurance about that. But in the long run, I think that uh, open standards, open source code, uh, greater visibility really leads to uh, more thoughtful design, more analysis of the design, and, and greater security in the long run. People often ask me as a security professional, as a researcher in this area, you know, what do I do that's special, that's different from what other people would do? And I decided when I started to work in the field, which is now almost 20 years ago, uh, just to try to do the same things that everybody else does. So I don't have a really special way of handling my passwords. I don't have a weird disk encryption that's different from what's co common and came with my operating system. I've tried over that 20 years to be uh, as uh, unsophisticated in my use of my computer and the way I buy things on online and so on because I figure, first of all, that's simpler. Second, I'm learning what most people are doing. And third, if somebody attacks me, then I have a story that I can tell. Even though you know you read lots of things about attacks online and so on, and I certainly encourage everyone to be careful and thoughtful, you know, nothing really bad has happened to me yet. Maybe by the time this video comes out, something bad will have happened and I'll feel differently. But even though there are many attacks and people trying to steal money and, and so on, you know, life is pretty good online for the most part. The academic researchers and industry have done a pretty good job in protecting most of us.